Welcome to the Resilient Retail Game Plan, a podcast for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable creative product business with me, Catherine Erdley. The Resilient Retail Game Plan is a podcast dedicated to one thing, breaking down the concepts and tools that I've gathered from 20 years in the retail industry and showing you how you can use them in your business. This is the real nuts and bolts of running a successful product business, broken down in an easy, accessible way. This is not a podcast about learning how to make your business look good. It's the tools and techniques that will make you and your business feel good, confidently plan, launch and manage your products, and feel in control of your sales numbers and cash flow to help you build a resilient retail business. Welcome. It is episode number 120 of the Resilient Retail Game Plan. My name is Catherine Edley. I'm your host as well as the founder of the Resilient Retail Club, which is my membership group and consultancy for product businesses. To find out more about working with me one-to-one or joining the club, go check out resilientretailclub.com. And if you use the code 10podcast, that's 10podcast, you can get £10 off your first month in the club. Today, I wanted to talk to you about really my observations from being out and about over the last few weeks. We are now officially into the golden weeks. That is the time in the run up to Christmas where people spend the majority of their Christmas budget. And so the Christmas selling season is really kicking off. And over the last few weeks, I've been to several different events. I have been to Spirit of Christmas in London, to Stylist Live, to several markets and other smaller events, as well as spending a few days last week. Very, I was very fortunate to do so, but I was in Venice for a few days with a friend and we did some shopping. So it's always really good whenever you're feeling stuck or lacking of inspiration when it comes to your business. I do very much recommend a bit of retail therapy. This is something that I have learned certainly from my many years in the retail industry that if in doubt, if feeling unsure, then get out, go take a look around, go get some new inspiration, some new input, and also just really helps you get a sense of what people are looking for right now. What are they buying? Take a look at the bags that you see people carrying, get a sense of what people are spending money on and what seems to be working. It's always a really fascinating time when you go out and you spend time in retail with a bit of a critical eye, especially, I'd say, if you are a mostly online business, it's something that I recommend that you do regularly, but especially at Christmas. So if you haven't done so yet, make some time to go meander around a market, go to an event, go visit a pop-up, or just head into the centre of London or the centre of your nearest city, wherever you are, and take a look at what is going on because it's always really fascinating. And I can guarantee that you're going to come back with some ideas and inspiration. But Enough about that. I am going to run you through today five observations that I've made over the last few weeks. And I'd love to hear from you and find out if these resonate, if they sound familiar to you, if this is something that you've also experienced in your business. And if you want to come over to Instagram at Resilient Retail Club after this episode is over and share with me your thoughts, I would be very happy to hear them. And I'm also really happy as well to see where you are, where you are listening. So maybe you are at a Christmas event or maybe you are getting ready to go to a Christmas event or maybe you're packing up your orders, whatever it is that you're doing, then do feel free to share and tag me at Resilient Retail Club where you're listening to the podcast. So without further ado then, point number one that I wanted to share with you is that people are spending money. And I wanted to bring this up. I've been saying this a few times on social media, in the membership group as well. And I think it's an important message to put out there because many people are very understandably concerned about this Christmas and what it means for them and for their business. And it's very easy to fall into that very binary thinking about nobody's buying, nobody's buying anything. The truth is it simply is not the case. I have seen events that are packed. I have spoken to people who have had their best markets ever. I have spoken to people who've had their best online purchases ever. But I have to say that the overwhelming message is that 
yes, people are spending. Now, if you look at the headlines and you dig into a bit of the data in a bit more detail, you will see that for sure discretionary spending is down. The expectation is that Christmas spending will be down this year compared to last year. However, that is not the same thing as people are not buying. People are purchasing, they are spending money. They may have less money than last year, but they absolutely do have money to spend on Christmas. And just the number of bags that I've seen out and about, people are now starting to spend and they are buying expensive things. They're not just buying everything at the lowest price point possible. I've certainly seen people out and about spending money. And this is the time of the year where if they've been saving throughout the year for Christmas, which some people will have been doing, this is when the money comes out and it's available to be spent. So whatever you do in your business, just remind yourself that people are purchasing, they are buying and that there's every reason for you to get out there and to be promoting your business this Christmas. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about is something that I call micro niching. And it's really fascinating because I've been having a conversation with people about the kinds of products that are being sold at Christmas or the product trends that we've seen. And I'd say that micro niching kind of fits into a bit of a product trend. So what is micro niching? Well, it's that sort of niche within a niche And it's about people offering something that is very tailored to a specific customer. And it's funny because one of the things that got me thinking about micro niching was when I went recently to a fan convention for musical theatre that I took my daughter to called Musical Con that happened for the first time in London's Excel Centre at the end, roughly around the end of October. And they had a market stall area and it was rammed. In fact, this is one of my most popular reels on Instagram. If you scroll back, you can take a look and it it had a lot of viewers. And I think it really resonated with people because it was just packed. I couldn't even get near the stand. I think we waited in a queue for about 45 minutes to buy the merch from the event. So that just gives you a sense of just how many people were shopping. But what was really interesting about it, it was that obviously it was an event that had good footfall. But it wasn't predominantly a shopping event. It was more like uh, there were lots of different things going on. There were performances, there were workshops, there were talks. So it wasn't all about shopping. And the shopping area, in fact, wasn't even massive. But it was perfectly, perfectly in tune with what the customer wanted. So you're at a musical theatre convention. These people were selling musical themed scrunchies, scrunchies with musical names on them, stickers, calendars wall art, prints of the different theatres in the West End, but all to do with musicals. There was even somebody selling a cross-stitch kit specifically with musical lyrics on it. So we are talking super, super niche, not just cross-stitch for craft lovers, but musical themed cross-stitch for craft lovers. And it also ties in, a little while ago, I had a chat with, on the podcast, with an Etsy specialist and we were discussing how her Etsy shop really grew when she started creating micro niche products. So for example, not I love my dog, but I love my golden retriever, for example, that was one of her biggest sellers. So micro niching is about not being afraid to get really, really specific. And you may be able to Think about how this would apply to you this Christmas. This may just be one of those things to kind of file in your mind and think back for or put together for your plans for 2023. But I just wanted to bring it up because it really occurred to me that it's one of those things that people can get very nervous about. The other thing that made me laugh was when I was in Venice and I was thinking about this podcast and what I was going to say and I was thinking about micro niching and then I walked past the Venice rubber duck store, (laughs) which sold nothing but rubber ducks. So that's another form of micro niching. It can be to do with a product that is for one very, very specific person. It can also be about being very, very specific with one kind of product. People often are quite resistant to micro niching because they feel that it cuts down their audience, which definitely, I definitely hear that. I understand why that, why people would say that. But I think whenever you're considering micro niching, remember this, if you had a problem with your knee, if you had knee pain, would you choose to go to your GP? Now, let's just pretend for a minute that any of us <laughs> have any choice about which doctors we get to see. But let's just use it as an example. Let's say you had the choice between going to see a GP or going to see the knee specialist. Who would you go and see? And it may be that the GP is very highly competent, but the knee specialist just really knows knees. 
Or for example, if you wanted help with your marketing on LinkedIn, would you go to a general marketing specialist or would you go and talk to somebody who was a LinkedIn marketing specialist? Chances are you're probably going to go with a LinkedIn marketing specialist. And that's what micro niching really does for your business. And I have to say that as the marketplace continues to become crowded, as the customer has almost endless choice, the micro niching can be a way forward because it helps you really fit into that customer's mind when they see your product and it's right for them and the micro niching works. It's like my theory, my round peg, round hole theory, this, that often customers just want to see a round peg for a round hole. Now, some ways that it could work for you at Christmas is you could micro niche products that you've already got. It could be about creating multiple listings. It could be about just talking about your products, almost creating these micro niches. So for example, if you sell hand cream, could it be hand cream for gardeners? Could you talk about it as hand cream for gardeners? It could work. It may even be the same product that hand cream for, you know, new mums is, but it's just more about you actually really honing in on a specific use. And it also reminds me that when I, I spent many years working in clothing for you know, multi-million pound businesses, and one thing that we always had to be really clear on whenever we had an item of clothing that we were thinking about, this was particularly true with dresses. We always had to be really, really clear about what it was that the dress was for, where they were wearing it. And we had to make sure that it didn't fall in the gaps. So for example, occasionally there would be a dress that felt too dressed up, if you like, for day-to-day wear because of the fabric that was used or the embellishment or the cut or any other reason. But it wasn't really an evening dress or an occasion wear dress that you would wear to a wedding for another reason. So for example, one time we had one that was a patterned dress, but it had a lot of embellishment and it was just kind of a mixed message. And it wasn't really clear where the customer was going to be wearing it. And lo and behold, it was absolutely dreadful seller. So we always saw that when there was an outfit that was really, really clear and really obvious then that would always sell the best. Because for example, if you are somebody who is going to be a mother of the bride and you walk into a shop and you see a dress that really looks like it would work for mother of the bride, you're going to be much more likely to buy it than somebody who has to walk in there and try and put an outfit together without really much guidance. Really, that was about making sure that the product is really, really specific. And I think that that can work very well for small businesses as well. Just be really clear. Again, if it's hand cream, what's it for? What are they using it for? And then talk about those uses because that helps almost with that micro niching. So again, if you feel like you're not getting traction, I would think really clearly about who is your customer. Can you micro niche? Can you go deeper? If you know that you've got a kind of micro niche, maybe you are an organic kids wear brand and you really appeal, for example, to people who want gender neutral kids clothes. Could that be something that you lean into? Don't be afraid to be very specific because yes, in theory, there is a smaller pool of people who are purchasing from you. But on the other hand, when those people see your products and they recognize that this is exactly what they've been looking for, then they are going to be much, much more likely to purchase from you than if you are a general product that sort of appeals to everybody. So don't try and appeal to everybody it goes back to this theory as well as about how many true fans would you really need in your business? If you had a thousand true fans in your business, then what would that mean for you? How would that transform your business? If every time you launched something, there were a thousand people who were waiting to buy it or a thousand people telling other people about your business, what would that do for you? And Ultimately, as long as your micro niche isn't so micro, micro niche <laughs> that it's got less than a thousand people in it, then chances are you are potentially worrying unnecessarily if you think about cutting your niche back, because all you're doing is creating something that is more general and less appealing to that very specific customer. That was really something that's been on the top of my mind as I've been walking around and interacting with people, seeing these different events is that you don't have to be afraid to be really, really specific. And it can often actually be a very beneficial thing. The third point, which kind of ties into this, is that you can be very specific, but also don't assume that your customer knows exactly what you do and 
what you sell. This was something that really came up specifically when I was at some big events. So as I said, I was at Stylist Live. I was at Spirit of Christmas. And it was really interesting to see the stands. Bear in mind that Spirit of Christmas, for example, is a massive event. I think there are about 700 sellers. And you only have a certain amount of time. So of course, one of the things that my daughter and I did when we got there was we started walking up and down the aisles. And so we're kind of walking the floor. So we're making sure that we're seeing everybody, saying hi to the people we knew. But also we were kind of scanning, if you like. We were walking along and we were looking at all the different things that they were on display. And for some people, we would literally walk past their stand and it would just be like a few seconds by the time it takes you to walk from one end of the stand to another. And if I wasn't pulled in or if we weren't clear about what it was that they sold or it wasn't really obvious, chances are we were going to keep on walking. So if you are at an event, a physical event, just make sure it's really, really clear what it is that you do. And the funny thing is sometimes we would see stands that were so heavily accessorized with props and things like that, that it became slightly unclear as to what was for sale and what was not for sale. So yes, of course, you want to dress your stand. You want it to stand out, but just make it really clear. And sometimes it was as simple as just having a strap line, hand poured soy candles. Okay, that's fine. That makes sense. Ethical fashion, ethical homewares luxury stationery, all of those things, just simple strap lines to make sure that the people walking past understood what it was that you were doing. Because yes, some people may have brand recognition if they know you, if they follow you on social media, but most of the time people are just going to be scanning and walking, scanning and walking. This was definitely something that we would see a lot when I worked in big store chains that we would really have to think about this very carefully because you have seconds It's just a matter of seconds. Even if somebody walks past your open store, they would like look in, turn their head, look in if you were lucky. Or if you were in a concession, say in a department store or something like that, they would glance in, see what you had, and then they would keep going. And if it wasn't clear, if the concept wasn't clear, if there wasn't what we would call a shopper stopper, so something to really catch their eye, people would keep moving. And it's the same thing at these big events, probably not even all just big events, but any events. Is it really clear what you're selling? Don't assume that people really know these things. Just be aware that you have to make it clear and tell people what it is that you are selling. The same goes for your website, to be honest. It's a similar amount of time. Even if you're not somebody who sells in an event, make sure that when somebody lands on their website, they've only got a few seconds that they're going to take a look. And if you don't have your most prominent products there, they might wonder what it is that you do. I quite often see people will put like a lovely photo up as their homepage image. But in all honesty, if that's not one of your best sellers, you're really reducing the likelihood of somebody clicking through on it. Because unless you sell what is in that photo, it's just going to look like meaningless noise. You want it to be really clear. You want it to be really concise. And you want to not make any assumptions at all about what your customer understands about what you sell. So point number four then is that Selling can feel really good for your customer. And this is something that's occurred to me several times, but I wanted to flag it because I know that often people feel concerned about selling, especially at a time like this, when people are worried about the economic outlook, they're worried about the customer's finances, all of those things. And they forget the fact small businesses in in general tend to struggle a little bit more with selling than big businesses, mostly because big businesses train their teams on selling skills right from the get-go. And they just see it as a sort of fact. It's not even really a point of discussion. It's just clearly you're there to sell. So if you are somebody who finds selling difficult, just remember that as a customer, again, another reason to go out there and experience this for yourself and be reminded, selling can be a really, really pleasant experience. This is the time of year I start doing my Christmas shopping. So I have been purchasing at the events that I've been at. And also when I was in Venice, my friend was looking for an outfit. So we were going in shops and talking to salespeople. And it's always a really good reminder when you do that, when you get out there and you go through retail as as a customer and you experience it from a customer's perspective. And you realize the extent to which having a helpful, knowledgeable salesperson talk to you, listen to what you're looking for and help you make a really good decision is actually really pleasant and can be a really positive experience. It does not have to feel pushy or uncomfortable or make you feel or your customer feel bad. It can be really fun. 
And there is a spectrum for sure. I certainly have been at stands or events where people have sort of jumped out at you and you felt it was quite aggressive and the tone was not quite right. And uh, I was at Stylist Live with Elizabeth Styles. And if you don't follow her, go follow her. She's great. She talks a lot about selling, but we were both talking about how there were certain people who were, to be honest, really hard trained salespeople who were jumping out and trying to sell you things. And then there were some people who were great salespeople because what they were doing was they were just having a conversation. They came over, they were helpful. They asked if we had any questions. They started telling us about the products. They started telling us about how they were made, what was in them, why they were so great. They started explaining why it smelt so good. If we said we liked it, but it wasn't quite what we were looking for, they made suggestions. And I have to say, that's probably one of the biggest things as well that came out of it was that's what they call suggestive selling. It's absolutely not unpleasant when the person is looking for what you've got. So for example, when I was in Venice, we were looking at outfits and the salesperson made suggestions about shoes and accessories and coats and all kinds of things. Now, did we take them? No, not necessarily. But the fact that was that we knew somebody who was an expert was there talking to us about these products, making suggestions that were very good suggestions that we maybe wouldn't have thought of of us ourselves. And that was a really, really positive experience. So I think it's it's just a really useful one. Again, go be a go be a customer, go experience it from the other side and see how it feels when you see something you like and somebody engages with you and is really delighted to see you and genuinely pleased to sell to you, plus has some great suggestions and maybe makes your life a bit easier by coming up with some other ideas or things you hadn't thought of. Maybe they gift wrap it for you. Maybe they offer you a gift set or explain how this is really great. All of those things are really helpful for you when you are shopping at Christmas time, especially. So don't be afraid to do the same for your customers. Don't assume that if somebody is talking to you and you are selling to them, you're telling them about your products, don't assume this is awkward or they feel uncomfortable because I actually think you have to go quite far to make somebody feel uncomfortable in a sales situation. And I have seen it before. I have seen people just be really over aggressive and you kind of get a bit annoyed and then walk away. But that's to be honest, most people are so far at the other end of the spectrum. I think it would be quite going some to make them make that mistake to, to really make your customer feel uncomfortable. I think mostly what you'll find is people are just really pleased to hear about your products. And if I see a brand and I really like it and they tell me about their products, they are the experts. So if they then tell me about other things that they have that I might not have spotted yet, then that's a real plus. I'm usually delighted about it. And often people do like to tick things off their Christmas lists. If they see a brand that one of their friends likes, possibly other of their friends will like the same thing. And if you've got a helpful sales assistant or the founder telling you all about it and how you can have this, that, and the other, and how it will be really beneficial, then it is really a pleasant experience. So don't shy away. And again, if you don't believe me, go out for a day when maybe you'll just think about it. If you're out and about doing your Christmas shopping, just enjoy the experience. Notice when people are selling to you, notice how it makes you feel. And I think it will help you really understand that actually selling can feel really, really good. Point number five, just really quickly, very few people ask me for my email address when I was out and about, even when I purchased from them. Sometimes people would ask me if I wanted an email receipt, which I often didn't because I wasn't particularly that bothered. But if they'd said to me, hey, would you like to join my email list? Then I would have and told me why, more importantly, told me why I should join their email list. Then I would have been much more interested in doing so. But most people did not even ask me for their email. And not that many people, to be honest, even had something like a competition or a reason to drive people to sign up to their email list. Some people had things like a QR code that you could click on, that you could take a photo of and then go to the email sign up page. But I didn't really see too many people really pushing it. And I really feel like this is a missed opportunity because you need to be able to market to your Christmas customers. You need to be able to market to them come January. You will really appreciate having those extra people on your email list if you take the effort to get them to sign up. And I know this was something that I talked about in terms of getting ready for events. I've already talked about this before, but I just can't 
stress it enough because I really didn't see that many people doing it, not that many people doing it in an effective way. I was certainly happy to enter competition if somebody asked me for my email address. Or even, as I said, if someone had said to me, instead of just saying, would you like an email receipt? They had said, if you give me your email address, I'd love to sign you up to our newsletter. You get the first to know about all of our new launches. You'll get special deals just for you, just for subscribers. Sometimes we do special pricing for subscribers. And of course, I can then send you your receipt for your records. It's just when people just say, oh, do you want an email receipt? It's almost like they're not selling me on the benefits. And, you know, really, to me, I didn't really see the benefit, just literally of giving their email for the receipt. I wanted to be sold to. I wanted them to sell it to me a little bit more. So if you are going to be at a physical event or pop up or anything else like that, please, 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 please think about how you can incentivize people to give you their email address because it will really be beneficial in 2023. Okay, so there are my key points. People are spending. Think about micro niching. Don't assume people know about your brand. Don't forget that selling can feel really good. And don't forget to ask for emails. And the Christmas shoppers are out. They are there. They are looking for things. They're looking for gifting. They are spending money. So make sure that you're putting your best foot forward as always. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you have a moment to rate and review on either Spotify, iTunes, however you listen to your podcast, that would be amazing. And of course, please do take a moment to subscribe or follow the podcast and you'll be the first to know about every new episode that comes out on a Thursday. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then I invite you to check out resilientretailclub.com. The Resilient Retail Club is the membership for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable product business. No more trawling Google trying to find the answers to your questions or wading through general business advice that speaks mainly to service-based businesses. Whether you're still at the idea stage or you've been going for a while but want to get more focused and organised when it comes to your business, the Resilient Retail Club is the place for you. With a library of courses tailored to creative product businesses, several live sessions a month and a supportive and active community, the Resilient Retail Club is the perfect membership to help you hit your goals faster. Check it out at resilientretailclub.com.